Thank you. What I want to um, talk to you about is entrepreneurship <coughs> and science translation. <coughs> I'm sure you've heard uh, a lot about uh, uh, a syndicate room and uh, uh, what uh, I want to do today is to ask the question, what are universities for? Why uh, uh, do we need technology clusters and why, why is it uh, that entrepreneurship and these really exciting small companies happen in clusters <coughs> and that uh, they're not evenly distributed throughout the country? Uh, and this is true for all countries, uh, especially the United States, for example. Then I'll go into science translation in particular, because the, the specialty uh, that uh, I suppose I've developed over the years is to do deep uh, technology deals, uh, science deals. A few words about entrepreneurship and uh, the Cambridge uh, uh, example. So what are universities for? Uh, I think uh, most people would agree that universities are for teaching. And we shouldn't forget that teaching is actually the number one uh, reason for why universities exist. There's also an interesting back of the envelope uh, calculation that you can do. If you look at the value of uh, universities, uh, or, uh, the value that is associated with the graduates of uh, universities, by just quickly multiplying the number of graduates that uh, maybe Cambridge produces every year with the average salaries that they're likely to get in their first year. And you compare that with the IP, for example, that research produces, uh, the ratio is about 100 to 1. So even very good universities will have an IP uh, income that's about 1% of the earning power of the students. So let there be no doubt uh, that the number one purpose and value of universities is the students. That's their number one product. Uh, <clears throat> everybody will also agree uh, that uh, especially our top universities do some outstanding research. Uh, and although the IP uh, that they produce uh, might not be uh, worth a lot, the indirect uh, value that they create by their research by enabling either large companies to produce better products or smaller companies to produce new startups uh, is um, very important. So, <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, if you translate that uh, to the Cambridge example, which I know best because I, I live there, we've got about 1,500 uh, high technology companies employing 57,000 people and a combined revenue base uh, of uh, 13 billion uh, pounds. If you look at the uh, value to uh, the university, uh, uh, they only have about uh, 70 companies where the university has a direct um, uh, shareholding in. So the uh, 70 uh, companies of the 1,500 companies are spin-outs. Uh, all the others are sneak-outs. <laughs> uh, why is that? Is that necessarily a bad thing? Uh, no, I don't think it is a, a bad thing because uh, many of the companies, of course, didn't need any IP from the university. But I know of not a single company of the 1,500 companies that doesn't employ Cambridge alumni. So again, uh, the real value is in the students. Now, you saw David Sainsbury in the previous um, picture. I was involved with David in writing a, a report for the government called The Race to the Top. And the race to the top made the following fundamental uh, uh, point. If you look at the importance of science in Western democracies and the importance of innovation, it is clear that an increasing proportion of the growth in our uh, e economies is due to innovation and new companies. Uh, now, as this percentage uh, of innovative companies is growing, the uh, process of taking breakthroughs, science breakthroughs, in universities and uh, getting them out of universities into uh, industry is becoming an increasingly uh, important process. So what we concluded in the Race, of the top, uh, uh, race to the Top <coughs> report is the reason we, we call it a Race to the Top is in contrast to the Race to the Bottom. 
Uh, there was no point in trying to compete with China making <coughs> cheaper Nike shoes. But there was a lot of point uh, competing with the best in the world, uh, mainly America and other uh, high technology countries, to compete with the high value uh, jobs and the high value companies uh, that we produce. Now, in order to do this efficiently, uh, Lord Sainsbury uh, introduced what's called the third uh, stream of funding for science translation. This is HEFKI uh, funding, uh, higher educational, a uh, high funding, I should say, higher educational innovation funding. So, in addition to funding for teaching, funding for research, uh, Britain now also has a funding stream. Uh, for innovation. So why do we have these technology clusters? Well, uh, what you really need is a world-class university at the center of these uh, clusters, but you then need some critical mass uh, of these companies. And Andy Richards, who I understand gave a talk last month, famously said that Cambridge had become a low-risk environment to do high-risk things in. Why is this? Well, if you are a, a young uh, entrepreneur or a, a young uh, expert in, say, silicon design or in, in DNA uh, uh, <coughs> design, I was going to say, this is uh, going to be increasingly important with synthetic biology, but uh, uh, a biochemist expert, if you move to Cambridge into a very risky startup, uh, <coughs> if that startup go goes belly up, as many of them do, uh, you don't have to move and get your kids out to different schools or something because there are another 10 companies in the same space and you have a very high chance of getting another job uh, in the same sector. So this is where the, the critical mass of high technology companies is very important in one area. I talked about the world-class university. Uh, I'll go more <coughs> into science translation in a moment. But the other thing that you need in a cluster, apart from uh, you know the clever uh, research, of course, is the entrepreneurs. Uh, and there, <coughs> we're getting a lot better uh, in Britain. Uh, there's a, a sort of culture of moaning that we're not doing as well as the people in the US. And this, of course, is true. We're not as good as, uh, as Silicon Valley yet. Uh, but I think the right way of thinking about how well we are doing is to compare our clusters, say the Cambridge clusters, and how well we did 10 or 20 years ago. And there, I think the uh, progress is pretty impressive. And one of the main reasons why it's getting so much better and why Cambridge is now finally firing at all cylinders is we now, <coughs> at Amadeus Capital Partners, for example, we do 70% of our deals with serial entrepreneurs. Not that we're not happy to deal with the completely new entrepreneurs as well, but there is so much talent around that uh, so many of the deals are now done by serial entrepreneurs. 70%. When we started with Amadeus in the, in the late 90s, we did 17% uh, of our deals in our first fund with serial entrepreneurs. So this has improved enormously. But there are also the lawyers, the accountants, uh, there are incubators. So most importantly, really, it's the people network. Uh, the, the Cambridge network, for example, that brings people together in, in meetings like these uh, to tell them uh, how we're doing, what we could improve, um, and what the latest uh, news are. And politicians just need to accept the fact that clusters grow slowly. We've just celebrated the 50th anniversary of the so-called uh, Cambridge phenomenon. So now on to science translation. I mentioned uh, the third stream funding already, the high funding, uh, uh, the race, uh, 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 race to the top, which now has become really a race between nations. Uh, uh, because it is so important for the growth of any economy to have this innovation, those nations that organize themselves better uh, to get uh, the innovation and the, and the breakthroughs out of universities into industry, making uh, products and new services with it, those are the nations uh, that will be uh, successful. It's important to have good technology transfer offices, but here I want to make this point of differentiating between evolutionary uh, technologies, evolutionary ideas, and revolutionary ideas. And of course, it's very important to have 
uh, venture capital and it did uh, syndicate room capital to support these science translation projects. So let's go to evolutionary ideas. And I suppose the classic evolutionary company, uh, of course, is a motor car company or a, an aerospace company. And we're very fortunate that Britain has one of the best aero engine uh, companies in the, in the world with Rolls-Royce. <coughs> and Rolls-Royce has a very clear idea of what the next generation technologies uh, uh, are needed in order to make air engines more efficient, uh, to get more thrust, uh, to get more efficiency, uh, especially uh, 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 now that um, uh, they, uh, 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 the airplanes are really the, the main polluter in the world. But when it comes to revolutionary ideas, startups are often better because revolutionary ideas sort of go against the grain of the established companies. So it is really remarkable that the world's best electric car is not a Mercedes, BMW, Audi, or VW. And uh, everybody, I think, accepts that the German car industry is probably the best and most innovative uh, in the incremental sense in the world. Why is it that the best electric car comes from a startup in California? It is really remarkable. And the answer is that if you look at the core value of traditional car companies, uh, <coughs> there is a fantastic ecosystem now of component suppliers for the wheels and the gearbox and the electrics and whatever you have. But if you look at, if you talk to a guy from BMW or Mercedes, what they're really proud of, it's their six cylinder engine or their 12 cylinder engine. That's really what makes their uh, their blood uh, uh, flow. So for them to believe that their cherished, uh, you know, six-cylinder, 300 horsepower, uh, wonderful BMW engine would be replaced by this electric motor, you know, that's, that's it jars. So it needs to uh, have. Uh, you need to have somebody like Elon Musk <coughs> who completely reinvents the car round uh, an electric. Uh, uh, base and there are really a number of uh, uh, of very exciting things that uh, have happened with uh, the Tesla. Uh, it's a so-called skateboard car. For those who've heard this, where the if you take the the body off, what you're left with is really just a skateboard, which consists of the of the batteries. And when I saw this, I I, I had to buy one because I just couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they have one in the in the in the West Westfield Center. That, that was the only Tesla place that you could go to because when I bought, I was one of the first ten people in in, in Britain who bought one. Uh, it was not just the, the batteries that impressed me. It was that that motor that's that's about this big. It's about uh, 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 420 horsepower that sits down there next to the wheel. Uh, it has one core which drives the differential, then the half shafts, then the wheels. So there's a total of 20 moving parts in this, com in this car. So it was just, just reinventing these things where you start uh, with a completely different concept of, of a car. And uh, the uh, amazing success of the Tesla there, they haven't sold that many. Their, their sales is, uh, is about $3 billion um, dollars now, but the value of the company is $25 billion, and that's half the value of BMW. Now, how did they manage to get half the value of BMW in just uh, a few years? The answer is implementing revolutionary ideas. I'm also pleased to tell you that our most, uh, our most ancient uh, um, scientific society, the Royal Society, has decided to establish a standing committee on science, industry, and translation, uh, SIT, uh, which I co-chair with uh, Simon Campbell of GSK. Uh, and <clears throat> this meant, uh, the reason uh, for this is that uh, the Royal Society decided, in, in particular Paul Nurse, the new president of the Royal Society, decided that in many ways the Royal Society had become maybe a little bit too esoteric. Uh, <clears throat> too much uh, uh, thinking about uh, uh, you know the, the uh, uh, just about the uh, the highest quality scientific results rather than uh, reflecting the original mission of royal society, which is excellence in science, 
but also the application of science for the uh, improvement of, uh, sci of uh, society and mankind. Uh, I, I <coughs> would just like to uh, remind you of the famous Harris clock, which solved one of the biggest problems of the uh, British Navy and, and British shipping at the time, which was to know where the ships are, which uh, uh, you know was uh, important then as it is now. Uh, <coughs> and the second thing uh, uh, which I uh, have been involved in is a report I wrote for the government in 2010 on technology innovation centers, which are now called catapults. Well, uh, this is the fear of every lecturer that this would happen. <laughs> Let me turn this off. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and uh, I, I'm pleased to tell you that uh, this is now being implemented, and uh, the government has spent about 500 million on uh, creating uh, seven of these catapults more of which uh, later. Uh, there's been a lot of controversy about the name uh, because the catapults, of course, reflects the latest technology, uh, and, uh, uh, but it's really been around since Roman times. Uh, <coughs> and this is really what it is about. It's all about uh, translating <coughs> new ideas uh, through these different technology readiness levels. I don't know how many of you have come across these TRLs before they uh, appeared at NASA, where TRL1, Technology uh, Readiness Level 1, is one experiment in some science lab that says, whoops, I've got a, a new idea, and it worked once. Uh, and TRL Level 9 is, uh, we've put it on a satellite, and it uh, uh, was OK up there for, uh, uh, for the last 10 years. Uh, <coughs> so there are all these <coughs> different levels in between, and the catapults are trying to work between technology readiness level 3 and 7 to 8. So it's trying to bridge this gap between university research and uh, deploying it through industry. So there are seven such catapults. High value manufacturing and satellite <coughs> have pre-existed. And then the last uh, five, which is cell therapy, offshore renewable energy, future cities, transport, and the digital economy are five new ones. And I've just done a review of all of them uh, with the result that uh, things are actually looking pretty good. Uh, <coughs> why should we have catapults at all? Why should the taxpayer uh, invest in these intermediate institutions to translate the university results into industry, into products for UK PLC? Well, in my opinion, these are the criteria. We shouldn't do that for small markets. It really has to be a substantial market that we can address so that it actually moves the needle for UK PLC. Uh, <clears throat> it's something that has to uh, build on UK strength. So this is not an initiative to fill in holes. This is an initiative uh, to build on mountains. Thirdly, it must be a platform technology that benefits an entire sector, not just a single company. And last but not, uh, not least, there should be enough absorptive capacity in uh, the country to make good use of it uh, once it works. So there should be an exploitation strategy. This is not always easy to explain to politicians because their knee-jerk reaction to exploitation of uh, technology that might be <coughs> developed in a catapult is, let's hog it all. Well, if you hog it all in the UK and you're trying to do the whole value stack in the UK, it's uh, absolutely a recipe for failure. Why? If the market is really large, it must be a global market. If it is a global market, it is extremely unlikely that every stage of the value uh, chain would be best <coughs> done in the UK. So the right way of thinking about this is to choose the partners that are world class in the different layers of the value stack, and then pick the one where we are competitive, where there is a large value add, and say to the world, this is the bit that we are going to do. If you want to play in there, you've got a fight on your hands, and we're going to win this, because we're going to be the best in there. Technology transfer. Well, if you want to t uh, uh, transfer technology out of universities or indeed uh, corporate research labs, there's only one way of doing it. I know no other way of technology transfer and 
uh, technology transfer, but transferring people. It doesn't necessarily need to be the professor who uh, heads up the laboratory that made the breakthrough, but it's got to be somebody from his group. Because the IP itself, the patent, if you throw it over the wall, is useless. You need to have the know-how, how to implement uh, the idea that might be described in a patent. You've got to have the green fingers uh, to uh, <coughs> make something of the patent once it's over the wall. It needs uh, really the ecosystem uh, of people both at the university, at business, the venture capitalists, the government, and of course also uh, the lawyers and accountants to do their job. And, uh, uh, and you need to find the right uh, people that actually understand startups, that understand technology transfer. It's something that is very different from working for Rolls Royce or for the big companies. And this is hard. Uh, there is no silver bullet. Uh, and uh, the key to making this uh, a success is entrepreneurs. Now here we've got the archetypal uh, entrepreneur, the, probably the most, well, now with uh, Apple being the, the, the most valuable company in the world, you can argue that he has been the most successful uh, entrepreneur ever. A very nice person for those of us who knew him, uh, but <laughs> <laughs> He invented the iPhone, and I remember very well when he presented it and said, uh, we've reinvented the phone, and then, here we go again. <laughs> <coughs> but he did. Uh, and it was absolutely brilliant, and of course is now the, uh, uh, the heart of uh, the, the money machine known as Apple. What do they look like, these entrepreneurs? Well, uh, if we as venture capitalists uh, look at a deal, the number one uh, thing I look for in a team is this passion. This unreasonable belief uh, that uh, they can do something, uh, they can uh, produce a successful company, when all the indicators really are uh, that the chances are very low, that it's not going to work. But because of this passion, they often defy <coughs> Uh, uh, gravity and they can do it. And they also have to be able to uh, uh, <clears throat> evangelize a vision as the syndicate room does so well with its two founders to lead a team and to understand the technology as well as the markets. It's that combination of having a good feel for both that people often forget. And uh, growing up in the Cambridge cluster, of course, this was, in the past, a serious problem. Now it's less of a serious problem, although it still exists, and it comes in the following uh, form, that it must be easier to tell our brilliant engineers uh, about marketing and uh, <coughs> bring them up to speed on marketing a bit. And this must be a much easier job than taking one of these brain-dead marketing people and trying to understand our brilliant, <laughs> <coughs> explain our brilliant technology to them. Uh, as it turns out, uh, not all the marketing people are brain-dead. I think there are some very smart uh, people there. They actually know a lot more about how to sell a product than the engineers ever will. And it is not incidental that the highest paid people in Silicon Valley are the product marketing managers, the, 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 the product uh, uh, managers, that have the ability to really understand the markets well enough to project the possibilities of the technology in such a way that they give the product the properties that are both technically feasible as well as really attractive in the marketplace. And this is something that is still not well enough understood in the UK. Now, Steve Jobs didn't have much understanding of technology, but he had a very good uh, way of interfacing with uh, technology experts. He just had this wonderful team of uh, uh, people who, who adored him because he, uh, <laughs> uh, he did everything for them because he, he knew that they would, uh, they would produce just brilliant products uh, uh, for him. And he listened to them, but he had a uh, a sixth sense of what uh, is really attractive uh, in the marketplace. And I've already made the point about venture capital. 
So I just want to tell you about uh, uh, Cambridge because I live there and I've uh, 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 known the place for a while. As you know, Britain is blessed with four um, world-class universities, four in the top <coughs> ten. Uh, there is Cambridge, which sometimes is number one. Uh, we, we beat Harvard last year, I think. Sometimes we're number two, but we're always in the, in the top three or four. And then there is Imperial. Uh, there is, of course, a UCL, uh, and then there is a, a fourth uh, university <laughs> to the west. <laughs> <laughs> Name I always forget. Uh, we were founded in uh, <coughs> 1209, so we're 800 years old. Uh, we've got more Nobel laureates than uh, any other country, uh, any other university in the world. In fact, Cambridge has more Nobel laureates than any country in the world, with the exception of the United States and Germany. And we have the Cambridge uh, uh, phenomenon, which in aggregate now employs more people than Rolls-Royce uh, and uh, actually has more revenue than Rolls-Royce. So this, you know, when you tell politicians that we've got 1,500 technology companies employing 57,000 people and the 30 million pound revenue and 14 billion dollar uh, 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 companies, it goes in one year, comes out the other, go, goes out the other. But if you tell them that in aggregate, Cambridge is actually more important than Rolls-Royce, which is the, the largest FTSE 100 companies that's actually smaller than Cambridge in aggregate, uh, they, they can remember that maybe Cambridge is important. So I now just want to quickly describe uh, two companies uh, that I've been uh, closely associated with because out of the uh, $14 billion companies, actually it's now $15 billion companies, um, uh, only five of which have anything uh, to do with me, uh, this is the one uh, that's the most successful. Uh, of the 15. It's uh, ARM, which is spin out from my first company, uh, Acorn Computers. It's based on the uh, risk processor idea, which interestingly was a breakthrough at Stanford and Berkeley. Uh, <coughs> uh, it was John Hennessy and Patterson at Berkeley that invented risk. Normally the story is that Britain invents it and the Americans exploit it. Well, here we've got the, the inverse, that the Americans in invented it, but we in Cambridge had the first implementation even we had an implementation even before the inventor of RISC, uh, 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 Pat, um, uh, John Hennessy, uh, did it with uh, the MIPS company, uh, which isn't as successful as ours. Uh, we now have a market share of over 95% in uh, uh, mobile phones. Intel has about an 80% market share in PCs. Uh, we've now sold cumulatively, actually, it's gone, go, uh, gone up to 50 billion, uh, 60 billion. So on average, uh, there are about nine uh, processors per person on Earth. So you might ask yourself, well, where are, where are my, uh, uh, my nine? And the answer is they're in your pocket. Uh, the, uh, the average iPhone or any other smartphone has an average of 20 arms in them. I was really surprised that the number was so high. I thought it was more like uh, six or seven. But I talked to James Foss, who actually led the uh, iPhone uh, group uh, in Silicon Valley at, at, at Apple, as so many people at Apple, he is actually British. And he, he ran a, a company for me called Exmos for a while. And he said it's, it's, it's actually 20. And there's a very interesting reason for why this is. Uh, and it's, it's, it's really a, a, a new design philosophy. Uh, an iPhone, like many computers, are, are, of course, are products now that are really quite complicated. And it used to be the case uh, that if you have a particular function that you had to implement in silicon, uh, you would implement it in hardware. But if you actually uh, implement it on the base metal, so to speak, this is very tedious and very hard. And it turns out that if you have a particular function that you want to implement, it's now much easier to just put an arm on it, write a bit of software, and make, make the function in software rather than produce it all in hardware. And that's the reason why there are now 20 arms in an iPhone or iPad or any of the other uh, smartphones um, that you see. Out of the 60 billion, we, we sold 10 billion last year, which is more than Intel has sold in its entire history. Uh, but the more, uh, and so we are outselling uh, Intel 20 to 1, probably more than 20 to 1. But in a way, the most surprising statistic, and, and we, we, we repeat it all the time, but still, I, I don't think has has sunk in uh, with people that even in dollar terms, the dollar value of all the arms being sold worldwide has overtaken 
Intel revenues since uh, 2010. So even in dollar terms, ARM, not just in the numbers of ARMs, but in dollar terms, ARM is a more important architecture than Intel. Uh, and the reason why this is not so well known is because ARM uh, is uh, the world's most successful licensing company. Uh, but the value of the ARM chips itself mainly accrues to 350 licensees. So although ARM is worth about uh, 22 billion, uh, the revenue, which is more like 50 billion, accrues to Sony, Toshiba, Qualcomm, uh, NVIDIA, um, Intel actually has an ARM license as well, uh, and so on. And the second example uh, uh, that I want to give you uh, is Selexa. Selexa is a, a spin-out from the chemistry lab uh, in Cambridge and is now uh, the uh, machine that 90% of the gene sequencing uh, is done in the world. And as you can see on this graph, the cost of gene sequencing when we started, uh, uh, which no, we started here, uh, the, the, the cost originally of the first human genome was about $3 billion. It was a, a bit of an expensive exercise uh, <coughs> organized by the United States and, and Britain mainly. 30% of the human genome was actually done at the Sanger Center in Hingston, they did, made the single largest contribution to the original uh, human uh, genome. And in the year 2001, I think uh, Bill Clinton and Tony Blair announced the first uh, human genome. And then there was a very nice reduction in cost following a line very similar to Moore's Law. And I've lived off Moore's Law all my life. That's a factor of two every two years. So uh, two, to the five, two to the fifth is 32. That means a factor of 32 a decade. What happened here, because of the invention of sequencing by synthesis, which came out of the chemistry lab by two of our genius professors, uh, Ashanka Balasupramanian and <coughs> David Klenemann, uh, they had this idea of sequencing by synthesis. And look at this. It went from $10 million to now $1,000. That's a factor of 10,000 in seven years. I have never come across a reduction of any important parameter in any sector that's a factor of 10,000 in seven years. This has completely revolutionized uh, the, the health sector, and we will see the consequences of this within, within the next five to 10 years. Because what it enables is a complete change in the health sector away, uh, away from treating everybody the same to treating people according to their genome, uh, the uh, revolution for personalized medicine. And when you hear people talk about personalized medicine, don't forget it was Selexa that's enabling it. So in conclusion, I talked a little bit about technology clusters, the reason why science is so important, the catapults uh, that we shouldn't uh, forget uh, entrepreneurs. And then I gave two examples, which is Arm and Selexa. Thank you.